It gives you the shape of which people are often looking for love in all the wrong places so that you know how to engage it. It's sort of like people at the water cooler. Maybe they're not gathering there anymore, but we used to speak about that. (laughs) And if people are talking about a movie, what do you do as a Christian? If they're talking about a movie and you haven't seen it, maybe it's a movie you don't want to see or you shouldn't see. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to just necessarily put your hands in your ears and run out of the room saying eternal life, eternal life. How do you engage <laughs> how do you engage these people? Welcome back to Roundtable, a podcast produced by Mid America Reform Seminary. This is episode forty five, and I am Jared Luchibor. Thank you for joining us. We're continuing our series on Christianity and the arts today, this time talking about movies. You'll even hear me throw in my two cents as well. I hope you enjoy. Well, hello again. We are continuing our discussion of Christianity and the arts. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is Alan Strange. I'm not sure if I actually said my name last time, but uh, (laughs) I was introducing my fellows uh, and I still have with me Andrew Compton. Good to be back. And Jared Luchibor. Still here. (laughs) And we were talking about some of the kind of theoretical underpinnings, you might say, of the whole questions of aesthetics, art broadly conceived, beauty. We would like to make sure that you understand that we don't think if you're not immersing yourself in high art or something that you might think pertains to the elite, um... We're talking about something as simple in some ways as enjoying a beautiful sunset Mm. or standing in awe at the Grand Canyon or the seashore. That's where you're appreciating God as the great artist. Uh, Maybe if you're having a nice camping trip. Uh, On the other hand, we understand associated with that, distinguished from it, but associated with that are are crafts Mm. and people who may be cabinet makers. I've seen some magnificently made cabinets homes you see the architecture you see the the all of the building that goes into them oh, the, so there's the eye a, for wood grain exactly that, that shows up exactly there's lots of, i had a I, I had in my last congregation in new jersey i had a wonderful fellow he was english he also had american citizenship and he was considered a high level finnish carpenter uh, and he would go into the executive suites, this is out of Philadelphia, and he would carve in mahogany, uh, mm. scroll, ma- all kinds of stuff. So he was he was an amazing, but he was also a painter and all these other sorts of things. So he, he was an amazing, amazing fellow. But floored, floored me, if I can even throw another yeah. example, in a, pl- a place where there's beauty and there's art uh, and there's, there's a, a testimony to, to that which is right and true and orderly and reflecting God's glory. When I first went to college in Northwest Iowa, um, that fall seeing, or actually it would have been summer when I got there, seeing, seeing fields that mm. had been planted in perfect rows and perfect orders and, and different, uh, different shapes and patterns at work. And, and I was completely floored by that, that it, that one might think that, oh, agriculture, that has nothing to do with art. No, that's not true. And we There's love, we there. love our farm, uh, uh, supporters we love you all <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's um, that's the no mere are, tip of the hat yeah, there's a, really a, there's a wonderful thing beauty here. is truly all around us that's not a coffee mug saying right? right that 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 really is evident that's what's so exciting about well, talking about we were about ending this. up talking about how the the christian faith gives a particular kind of foundation mm-hmm. for art that greek philosophy never had mm-hmm. because we affirm the incarnation But let me just say this. This conversation also comes to the fore. Since we're a people of the word, it could be argued that our most steady diet should be of that in some fashion and not of the image. There's a Hmm. lot of discussion about this. Ken Myers, uh, in his uh, fun book, uh, uh, Blue Suede Shoes, All God's Children in Blue Suede Shoes, (laughs) his view of some of your back, has an interesting critique of the image and how it can't communicate with the degree of specificity that the word can. In other words, how do you show the cat is on the mat? You draw the cat on the mat. Well, how do you show the cat is next to the mat? Or is that the cat is off the mat? In other words, words do have a great precision. But Ted Turnow 
critiques Myers and others of that sort and defends the image and says it's its own proper medium. Now, Ted, in his book, Papologetics, which is a great book uh, for apologetic outreach, um, also gives some aesthetics defenses, you might say, of things like the image and the use of that in film and television. And so we want to think a bit about that. We've been talking about literature and the art, uh, but in, this may not be considered by some people as high art, but you see, we're not making a much of that distinction here. We'd like to think a bit about film and TV and even theater. And yes, that's I'm spelling that with an R-E. We're being a little bit British there. <laughs> and what we mean are Canadian. Um, I know our listeners are glad what we mean for that there is the, What we mean there is the stage as... Uh, compared to the film studio mm -hmm. or the television studio. Um, developments in TV and film, though, are, are very interesting. Um, it seems to me just, and most of our our listeners could probably attest to this. I know I've had this conversation with my children a number of times. And when they've watched old shows, old TV shows from the 60s and 70s, uh, and then as compared to the writing on shows these days. The writing tends to be much better. The production values tend to be much better. It's an interesting thing. You, big stars of the past would never be on a TV show. Mm. They would never think about it. They were in the films or at the cinema or the movies, whatever you like to call them. Uh, that's what they were in. And they wouldn't they wouldn't grace the small screen, only the big screen. But that's... Uh, a lot of things have changed that. Technology has changed that because you can you can have a continuous story these days in TV series because people have access to it mm -hmm. in a way they didn't. Jared, do you have any thoughts about the whether it's the developments uh, in TV and film? You've studied this. Um, and is it better now? I mean, I, I also would say you could say it's worse in some ways, right, <laughs> in terms of eroding moral values and, and hostile to Christianity. There's that too, but... What do you think about where film and TV was? Maybe you just want to speak about one of them and speak about some of the technical aspects even and how that's improved. Yeah, I, I think uh, I could probably speak more to film than I could of television. Um, coming all the way, you know, from the, the late 1800s um, till now, of course, we've seen an incredible uh, increase in development of film and technology. And I think that's been able um, to expand... Um, the ability of storytelling itself. You think of uh, the advent of synchronous sound being applied to film. Well, now you've got this uh, ability to to talk now in movies. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to expand and lengthen uh, your story because people can actually talk now. You think of The General, an incredible silent film with Buster Keaton. The only um, way of understanding what was going on is with placards of text being on the screen. Mm -hmm. But now that... We can hear people talk. Oh, we have talkies. Oh, <laughs> this is uh, this is very enlightening. I'm enjoying this. Well, that is so we've got something beyond Fred Ott sneeze. Was that the right name of that Fred Ott sneeze? You remember that very early with, that Edison did of a guy sneezing. Right, yeah. right, right. It is interesting that that even even the history of of film. Again, I, I uh, it's not not really my an area I've spent a lot of time with, um, but. Uh, maybe I should put it this way. I can speak a bit anecdotally. I um, there there's a musical I've always liked, Sunset Boulevard by Andrew Lloyd Webber, and I think it's based on a, an older movie. And but it's it's this um, it's this old silent movie actress who's now having to cope with the fact that she's been left behind in the world of talkies, and and she sings at one point one of her main numbers. You know, um, you know I can the the emotions I can convey with with one you know with one look. Um, I can I can create the past. I can draw your attention in ways that a bunch of words can't do. And it is interesting to actually go back and watch some of these silent movies and to see that the skill of the actors who are speaking lines that you can't hear because, like you said, Jared, they have the, the text up there. Um, but but the the way they carry themselves on screen, and then even from our perspective today in 2020, when you look at some of these these um, early and and just older films. It's really remarkable um, the quality of acting, 
how these these individuals have honed this craft of playing a character and conveying lines. Uh, I, I think of um, recently. I wanted to. I, I I was struck at how all the Harry Potter movies use some very famous um, actors and actresses, um, and, and one of them being Dame Maggie Smith, who who played one of the the, the professors at the Hogwarts school, and yet who had a, a lengthy career of incredible performances and watching an old black and white and these including long, on the stage. Oh, right, right. Oh, I mean, that, that's the stunning thing. These, some of these, uh, but watching the ability to, to speak these lengthy monologues in some of these older movies, uh, and, and to, to just grip the audience, um, that there's, there's some incredible things that were happening, uh, in, in early film and an ability to, to showcase excellence and modeling, you know, really recreating something we could almost imagine in real life. Uh, there, there's a, there is some substantial um, skills that went into that. Especially in the early 90s with, or even back in the 70s when you had uh, movies like uh, Westworld and Tron come out. Um, and then really in 1993 when Jurassic Park was released, that just completely revolutionized mm. uh, computer-generated images. And then um, opened the 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 floodgates of building whole new worlds and then you have lord of the rings come out in in 2001 you have avatar come out which was revolutionary and it's 3d viewing of of movie going experiences too and it seems that it's interesting because we are talking about the development and some of the pros and cons and in some sense those are incredible pros seeing how how film and tv has utilized computers and recreation of worlds and creation of new worlds but also how that has in some places distracted from uh, some of the great acting. Well, let me just say this. I, I don't really know. Jared, I need you to school me in this. Uh, but I ha- I was amazed by a more recent uh, film uh, that was a Netflix film by Martin Scorsese, uh, The Irishman. You mm. talk about great acting. Well, it has... It has, among many others, well, well, there's there's Joe Pesci, and mm. there's Bob De Niro, and there's Al Pacino, uh, three great actors, and they, I didn't, I just don't know much about this. They use CGI techniques to to make them look younger. Yes, yes. yes. So yes. you have, you know, Bob De Niro now. He and Pacino, I think they're like a year or two apart. They're mm-hmm. in their mid to later 70s. Right. And then they showed them playing, you know, the Pacino role. He's playing uh, Jimmy Hoffa, the Teamster leader. And um, the, 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 the way that they, they look, you know, 30 years younger, and then they move up to the time because it ends with Bob De Niro in a nursing home more – more like himself, maybe aged a bit, but they did all these pinpoints on the right. person. And can you say something? Well, they about that? they actually uh, resurrected practically um, the gentleman. I can't remember his name. Perhaps you can remind me who played Grand Moff Tarkin in the New Hope Star Wars. Um, that uh, a movie came out a few years ago, Rogue One. It was a, a Star Wars story, but it took place in the same time period as A New Hope did. And Grand Moff Tarkin was a character in that movie. They had to bring him back. And they did an incredible job of having an actor um, on set. But like you said, I, I, I believe they had um, they had some sort of facial recognition um, techno pinpoints on his face right. to replicate um, this I can't remember his name. This actor's face and uh, his voice even was just on key. And even um, this is going to sound really bad. Who played Leia? Carrie Fisher. Yes. Carrie Fisher. Okay. Um, they brought back her younger version of Leia in that movie too. Just incredible what we've been able to do. It's almost infringing on f- the freedom of some people a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is It is rather remarkable, the technology. And, of course, one of the concerns has been that as the technology improves, the the art will suffer. And I think in, in some places yeah. that has happened. In other words, the, the technology, which is interesting because you could say, well, is this really art or is this something technological? I mean, the, the, the art... The art belongs to the story, to the acting, and and th- those are not essentially technological uh, features. They're they're intellectual, artistic features. 
how well something is written, how well it's acted. But I think that they need not be opposed if in the hands, if I may say, I think Scorsese is a good director. Uh, Many would consider him one of the great ones and that he can take and do with great actors. Uh, To me personally, that's an appreciation for CGI uh, Mm -hmm. as opposed to just, um, you know, whole creating whole worlds out of, uh, out of virtually nothing and, and letting that, letting that stand in the place of something well-written and well-acted. I mean, it just, I don't want to be too personal here, but we can think of something like Titanic, which is a remarkable film in terms of its production values. Yeah. That, the, the sequence of the sinking of the Titanic is nothing short of brilliant. It's just brilliant. But it would have been wonderful if the film had had a writer and you had had, dialogue beyond Jack Rose Jack <laughs> Rose if you know if, if they would have spent a little money and uh and that director who I won't name everybody knows who he is has that tendency I mean Avatar also was a film of his that's because he's more of a businessman than he is a film director right but he really should just put out a few bucks and hire an actor in the past <laughs> a lot I mean hire a hire a writer a lot of the great a lot of the great directors, I mean, Hitchcock is a favorite of mine. Well, he, he would storyboard up this. He was a master director, but he did not write his stuff. He got good writers, just like he got good composers. I mean, Bernie Herman and his score to a lot of Hitchcock's films is as much a character in the film as is anything. Well, and this is really, um, it's interesting. Some of our listeners may even maybe this is goes without saying, but they'll hear us talking about movies and we're not saying, good thing we don't watch those because we're Christians. Good thing we're we're not spending all our uh, you know, we're not spending all our time wasting them on this frivolous entertainment, but but we're rather we're meditating on the things of God. No, look look at how we're having this interesting conversation about excellence in movie and and film and and TV recognizing that this is an area where beauty is expressed and which Christians can be involved with in very, uh, very confident and 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 in ways with 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 thankful hearts, bringing glory to God in their watching or in their production of of film and TV, but even bringing glory to God in our watching. Right. Of, now, how do we? But but there are these questions. And, and in I've fact, heard if them. you can't watch it. And and do so very consciously, coram Deo, right yep. before God, yep. and be glorying in Him. I mean, what does Paul say? If there be right in Philippians, and He gives you that list. If there be mm-hmm. any mm-hmm. excellence, we'll just sum it up. Mm-hmm. Think on these things. Right. And some people take it. I was brought up. That's what I meant in the very beginning of this, uh, Andrew. I was brought up in an independent, Baptistic, very fundamentalistic church that taught. Think on these things. When Paul says, think on these things, it isn't possible to be watching a film and thinking on these things. It's not possible to be reading a novel and thinking on these things. It's not po- And we're mm-hmm. saying, no, that's not at all the case, both because of common grace. There is the antithesis. We all hear very clearly affirm the antithesis and you can look at you can look at an art a work of art sometimes you see just very clearly portrayed unbelief sometimes it's helpful to see that portrayed in a way to to expose our hearts to show us who we are to show us our need uh, but on the other hand we do believe we can look at great art of all sorts and worship God rejoice in God glorify mm-hmm. God. You know, and there's always an evaluation to be made. We want to think biblically about the movies we're watching. We want to think as, in, in the TV we're watching, we want to think as Christians. Um, and yet that can get collapsed merely into this uh, question sometimes about the the ethical stances being portrayed on the screen or the behaviors being portrayed or the stance of the, the film writer or the producer uh, or whatever. And there's, there's really limits to that. Um, you know, some you know, I've heard the I remember hearing the expression uh, as a kid in young people's groups. Well, here's a pan of brownies I just made, and I I mixed in just the tiniest bit of of dog poop, uh, just the tiniest bit though, and that was the illustration of why. Well, this might be a great movie, like you're saying, but but there's some profanity in it. It's just the tiniest bit. Well, wh- why would you consume that? 
But that does raise that there's there is more going on we're proposing than simply counting up the number of swear words or counting up the number of questionable behaviors, right? Something that Francis Schaeffer uh, wrote in his um, his description of art and the Bible is he asked, what kind of judgment does one apply then to a work of art? He says, I believe there are four basic standards. One, technical excellence. Two, validity. Three, intellectual content and the wor- or rather the worldview which comes through. And finally, the integration of content and vehicle. And also one of the things I use in my applied apologetics where we talk about all of these sorts of things in a proper way, particularly with a view to how do we reach the world to whom this is their whole life and they mm-hmm. have nothing else. One of the things I use is a, a sheet similar to what Schaefer is doing, but it's much more spelled out mm-hmm, with respect mm-hmm. to film uh, that I could send to anybody who wanted it. But it comes from John Frame's course that he used to teach at Westminster Seminary mm. uh, on uh, Christians at the movies. Interesting. And he, he taught a course and and had a whole grid of uh, analysis having to do, of course, with common grace and the antithesis. Mm-hmm. Where do we see common grace here in spite of the unbelief of the filmmaker? Where do we see uh, the antithesis? Where do we see opposition yeah. to God? And how do we engage this? And how does this help us understand better? It's sort of like, you know, I've had people ask me, uh, when they ask me what I read, and I tell them what I regularly read, and one of the things that I read quite carefully is the New York Review of Books. Mm. And the New York Review of Books is the premier left intellectual journal on books in the country. And people say, why on the earth would you read that? Because I want to know what they are saying, and I want to read it for myself and to see it. Now, I, I would agree that not every person needs to do that. Mm -hmm. If you can't do that and you don't have the theological, philosophical uh, wherewithal to be able to read it and to withstand it, and I I teach this. So we do understand that. We're not saying everything. My mother always used to say, everything is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's right. We would agree with that. And I think that's what Professor Compton is saying. You have to use discernment in film and television and all these things. Mm -hmm. There's stuff that you ought not to watch. If this stuff is dragging you down, if it's inflaming greed or lust, it's interesting. We always say lust, but I think there are a lot of other things you could watch that that make you angry in sinful ways, that make you greedy in sinful ways, particularly greedy. I mean, and, and never mind just the commercials. Now, see, right? We're we're not even talking about the films now. Yeah, we're we're yeah. talking about the commercials, which which are are working there. But well, and I and I, what you just said there also connects to I think something we as Christians um, are called to do, and and how film and and TV and the arts and music, even pop music, how how these kinds of things can can play an important role in our in our witness to the work of Christ, in our evangelism, in our uh, in our movement toward outsiders, in the hopes of sharing with them the the reality of things, the truth of the gospel, the truth of 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 creation. And I've I've brought this up in my um, when I've taught catechetics here in the past that that listening to pop music, you know, uh, and listening to these cheesy little computer generated rhythms that go skyrocket to the top 10 or whatever, um, listening to this kind of music um, is an opportunity to listen to our modern day bards, our modern day storytellers, right. placarding what the values of the modern day world. Now, granted, a lot of them are trying to promote those values, but you can also hear them as reflecting those values and thereby reflecting a world that so desperately needs the true story of the world. Right. But unless you know the contours, unless you know sort of where the soft spots are, um, how are you going to really effectively communicate that message? And so listening to a Taylor Swift album, for example, is going to give you, you know, again, one generation uh, one perspective, but probably a widely held one based on how popular Taylor Swift is. But listening to Taylor Swift sing about the world will open your eyes to how the world's talking so that you're not just broad brushing what people are like out there, what young people are like, what millennials are like, what unbelievers are like. No, you, you're actually listening to them talk. It gives you the shape of which people are often looking for love in all the wrong places so that you know how to engage it. Precisely. It's sort of like people at the water cooler, maybe they're not 
gathering there anymore, but we used to speak about that. <laughs> and if people Everybody are talking about a movie, today. what do you do as a Christian? If they're talking about a movie and you haven't seen it, maybe it's a movie you don't want to see or you shouldn't see. Mm-hmm. But you don't want to just necessarily put your hands in your ears and run out of the room saying eternal life, eternal life. How do you engage <laughs> how do you engage these people? One of the ways to engage people, your next door neighbor, people in your own family who aren't believers, is if they're talking about, say, a film or a TV show or a pop song. Ask them about it. Don't be afraid. We have say, well, what mm-hmm, what mm-hmm. what do you like about that? What interest what what what's the uh What's the hook for you? What 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 does that do for you? And 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 let a person speak. And a person may say something about, well, this speaks to something deep inside me. Now you see, you're getting to something spiritual. All of this stuff. What we're saying in this series here is that we need to take the arts as the created reality that they are, because we know Him who is the great artist. He is the one we worship. We don't worship. Any uh, creatures, that's idolatry. Uh, And so we're not arguing for idolatry. We're arguing for an appreciation of what God has given, of what God has made and created, and what abilities he gives to men and women to make things. Um, But, of course, people misuse it because they're unbelievers. Uh, we Just like we don't think that we can't go to the store and buy something because it wasn't produced by a believer doesn't mean we can't watch something that may have been produced by an unbeliever. But we have to always do so in a way that we take every thought captive for the obedience of Christ. We have to do so wisely and we need to, we need to grow in doing so. We've talked about literature, art, and movies. Next time we'll talk about music, a category that Reverend Compton and Dr. Strange are certainly well equipped to talk about. For more podcast episodes, you can find us on sermonaudio.com as Mid-America Reform Seminary. You can find us on YouTube as well and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Be sure to search Mid-America Reform Seminary's Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time. <laughs>